Hello, welcome to the MMU Phil Sock podcast. I'm here with my co-host Aram, and we have, spe- we have a special guest on today, Alex Davies, who's from the Debating Society, and he is here to talk a little bit about anarchism. Uh, would you like to say a little bit about the Debating Society first to promote it in case anyone wants to, to look into that? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, the Debating Society is that's quite a small society. We get about five to ten people every session. Uh, we debate a range of things. So last time we debated anarchism, or we debated the role of the government or whether or not it's necessary. Uh, Aaron was part of that debate. Um, but then the debate before that, we were talking about other objective standards of art. Um, before that, <clears throat> we were talking about um, who shall win the election. So we, we go from a range of points, a range of things. It's not just politics. If you're interested in like um, other things like veganism or literally anything, just, just come along and... Um, <clears throat> Our, our, um, the, 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 the debate society's um, Facebook page is there. Um, I haven't got a link for it because I haven't really prepared for that. But um, I'll put it yeah, in the description yeah, just, of the video. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Go for it. I mean, you decide the topics that you're going to debate democratically, don't you, on the on the message board? Yes, yes. Um, so in our group chat, uh, I put I put up a number of um, suggestions. Uh, people can suggest more suggestions if they want to. Uh, it doesn't really happen. But, um, and then we have a vote on what we think should, um, should work. Uh, we tried that in my last debate society, which is at Sheffield Hallam, and that worked a treat um, in terms of like, getting engagement up and making sure people were actually like the, the topic that we were putting out. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, think, I think things should be done democratically as we'll get into yeah, so it's kind of an anarchist society then, the, the organisation is kind of anarchist in the way that you select the, the topic. It's, it's most definitely compatible with anarchist values, but um, even if it wasn't necessarily democratic, it would still be anarchistic as in we're not coercing you to be a part of our society. But you could, there could be some debate on whether or not the members of debate should own the debate or control the debate, but you know, it, I, it's, it's compatible with what I'd call an anarchist society. So. Mm. Yeah. I was going to say though, um, like one distinction about um, you know anarchism is what is like anarchism is completely against the state now. What is the state? Because I mean, this is a very good podca- like podcast for me because I'm at a bit of a crossroads. Like I am an anarchist as the t-shirt shows, but on the other hand, I'm kind of like in a space where oh, should I become a Marxist or not? Should I accept? like accept that the state is necessary because I mean some Marxists define the state as um the means by one that one class uses to impose their will upon another. What would how would you define the state? Well I generally just define the state as an organization which holds a monopoly of force. Um, mm-hmm. so and by that I mean I don't necessarily mean there being any kind of authority over a given territory. I mean um, oh, in a debate the other day we were talking about what the state was and yeah. um, we were talking about do our unions class of the state because they have uh, a degree of authority within that association. And I'd say, well, no, we don't have a monopoly on force uh, because the force that unions can use or the kind of rules that unions can have within those unions are um, dictated to them by the state. Uh, the state sets the guidelines, so therefore the state has the, um, the rules. So the state has a monopoly on force in that regard. Um, Marxists have uh, a very, very wide range of uh, definitions of the state, but um, the, the argument that you, the, the definition that you use, I believe, came from Lenin in yeah. the State and Revolution, when he's talking. It's a, it's, it's, it's a book about. He's, he's addressing anarchists in that book. I've actually got that book over in the corner there. Um, I've actually I've read it. So um, my problem, my problem with um, that definition is, it kind of. If we talk about the government and what we mean by the government and what we're generally referring to, that we're thinking of. Uh, the people who set the rules, we're thinking of people who um, distribute the resources, make all the checks, but love, write policy. Um, and to do that, you need to have a monopoly of force. But when Lenin sort of says um, it's actually a tool used by one class to pin down another, then you can still have all the, uh, all the, all, all, all the mechanisms that anarchists disagree with, like you know the centralized central planning and all um, or coercive forces co- coercion used to support the regime uh, those can still exist but because you're not pinning down the bourgeoisie anymore because you've got rid of the bourgeoisie then it's technically a stateless society in their view 
Now, this is often uh, used to sort of confuse a debate between anarchists and uh, Marxist Leninists uh, because they often say, well, we want a stateless society too. Yeah, but not in the way as we define it. Mm -hmm. So, what we are talking about, we're talking about the removal of the monopoly of force. So isn't that um, kind of strange idea? Because don't you need an element of coercive force in society? Like, for instance, like the obvious case would be like if someone was violent, like a serial killer or someone was like, you know, like doing violent things, you would need someone to like eventually come along and like hit that person with a stick, wouldn't you? Like, you fulfill that role. Yeah, so when, when, the, uh, when you have a violent person and say they're coercing other people, but, well, that's what you're doing. They are violating the other person's right to freedom. They are violating the person's right to body autonomy, their, their right to um, use of property, uh, things like that. Then, yeah, you, there, are, there, are, there is a requirement for um, like protection agencies, uh, perhaps even a communal police force. I say police force very lightly. I don't like the idea of the police. The police is the, arms, the arm of the state, basically. Um, but like communal protection services, uh, can come in and they are justified in defending people's uh, rights in terms of like the right to life, right to autonomy. Uh, I don't consider that to be coercive force. I, I consider that to be um, retaliatory force. Um, so if you are forcing someone to your will coercively, then you're not being anarchistic. The resistance to that is anarchistic. So the resistance to the state would be anarchistic. Um, so it's not just the state we have problems with. Like, um, I can compare the state to all the, all the problems associated with the state to the mafia. I'm also opposed to the mafia just because they're not the government doesn't mean I think they're A-OK. Uh, the same way I don't think capitalism is A-OK because of its coercive nature and because of the way um, you still have hierarchies that quote unquote just justify themselves or impose themselves over swaths of land where people use that land. And uh, that's generally the problem I have with those organizations. It's not just the state that we're opposed to. Anarchism can be defined as a critique of um, high power structures or social hierarchies based on the premise that these things don't justify themselves. There's no ethical obligation to support um, a, a power structure. We think about how it's necessary for the people that are underneath that power structure. Um, so, for example, when we talk about um, kings and queens, they justify their right to power through divine will. Like, God chose us to be the leaders, etc. Um, and we reject any kind of idea that um, these hierarchies are essential for a functioning society to, to work. So, and we can go into that, because that's basically what anarchism is. It's just, it's just a, a, a critique of the idea that um, these things yeah, are... Cut you off. Is it okay if I cut you off? Like, I I've literally not... just finished. I've I've got an inquiry like about um the police. Like, wouldn't the difference between an anarchist quote unquote police force and what we see as police today is that the police will be democratically controlled by the people? Like let's say if a police chief went rogue and like you know acted like racist or whatever, we could like the people could collectively like fire the dude. But um in addition about like punishment, didn't anarchist Catalonia have prisons? I think like. I think it was like voluntary yeah, like, work and stuff like did they yeah they, yeah the, the cnt had proper uh, work, uh, uh, labor camps mm -hmm. similar to uh, the bulag setup and, uh, and for that i criticized the cnt i don't actually define the cnt as a purely anarchistic organization it was a union at the end of the day and the problem we, we can go further into this but this is a debate i have with syndicalists uh, syndicalists are people who um, believe that the path to socialism is going to come straight from the union movement. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> their go-to with that is the CNT. Um, but the problem with the CNT was being a union and to carry out the functions it has to do with being a union, it can only represent the, its workers. It can't really say, no, we're anarchists. Um, and if you're not an anarchist, then off you go, because if you're a union, then you're supposed to be representing the general interests of workers. It's supposed to be improving the immediate mm. material conditions of those workers. And so you can't be excluding moderates or other kinds of revolutionaries. Um, so there was a bit of a mess with the CNC, as in uh, there's a lot of uh, people who were sympathetic to like uh, Marxist-Leninism. Um, and so the FAI was set up 
to sort of bring the CNC back to its anarchistic roots. And that, again, was just another mess. So um, there was constant infighting on how things should run. Sorry, should run. Um, so, yeah, there, there are, anarchists have done things in the name of anarchism, which uh, you kind of think, well, that's not quite anarchistic. But there's, and there's debates these, these theorists have about what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. But uh, yeah, but absolutely. Mm -hmm. So how would you outline, like, if, if you look far into the future and, like, anarchism, it, it does have a kind of utopian vibe to it where we're talking about, like, an ideal kind of society. Like, what, like if you could just, um, like, outline, like, what your kind of vision for the future of the human race would be, like, what would be, like, the ideal kind of society that you'd like to live in? Uh, well, there's, the problem is when, when you're advocating a free society, you, you, not, you can't really have an authority on how uh, free people organize themselves. So I imagine there'll be a, a wide range of different kinds of organization and, and the kind of setup that they have. But um, if we look to, if we base it anything on like history, so for example, the, um, there was a anarchist movement in Ukraine, which covered about 7 million people, which called the, uh, the uh, it's either called Matnovia or the Free Territory of Ukraine, uh, however you want to call it, and they were protected by the Black Army. And what they had over there was basically um, a mixture between communist, collectivist, and mutualist uh, economics. So some areas were communally owned, it was run by an anarcho-communist uh, method. Other areas had more of an emphasis on markets and um, co worker-owned cooperatives trading with others. Um, it's it really just dependent on how the people in the workplaces choose to organize and associate with the rest of the community. Um, but generally, uh, I focus um, how, how it's going to be set up. It's going to be in line with the principle of uh, use of property. So to me, if you, own, if you use something um, regularly, on a regular basis, that means you have a right to own it. So if um, we apply this to businesses and uh, rental, rental properties, uh, so the user in those circumstances, so the workers and the businesses, the renters in the rental properties, they should own the capital that they use. Um, now from then, you can have a range of things. So there's the idea of like a one big co-op movement where uh, these cooperate, cooperatives federalize and then become uh, a part of a much wider society like Mondragon is, or do you just go down the isolation, not the isolation, but like a more uh, competitive market route it depends how those people choose to associate the rest of their community. I think there are many, I mean, there's many different valid ways of doing it. Speaking of co like competitive markets and stuff, like what do you think about ANCAPs, like anarcho capital, like anarcho and capitalists? Um, do you think the system of capitalism is irreconcilable with the concept of anarchism, or do you think it is compatible? Uh, I think a lot of ANCAPs are um, very sincere in their positions. A lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time, I think they're quite sincere. Um, and they basically, they justify the hierarchy that capitalists have through them mm. proving their self-worth in the free market. Now, the problem I have with ANCAPism is, is effective, by, the, by virtue of absentee property rights, uh, you are effectively uh, self-justifying the uh, claim to power that the capitalist has over his company and thus over his mm. workers or the landlord has over the renters. And that, to me, just creates a plutocratic oligarchy where you have a concentrated class of owners setting the rules for everyone underneath. Um, and that's going to be a little bit of a problem. So in terms of, uh, in terms of that, I don't think ANCAPs are all that consistent um, with their views because everything you can, every criticism you can have of the state can equally be applied to a society where this class of people own the rest of the, own the, rest of the territory and pass rules and laws, I guess, on the people living on that land. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, now, there's one thing I, I normally like to, I like to call myself a free market anti-capitalist. Now, that's really important to me because what that does, it, it sets a distinction between markets, which are a space of voluntary exchange and uh, experimentation, versus capitalism, which refers to the absentee ownership of production. Uh, markets have existed for millennia. They've existed for way before capitalism. Capitalism is a fairly recent idea in terms of like um, or system in, in, in the context of human uh, civilization. But markets have existed for a long, long time. 
markets existed in the Soviet Union, markets existed under monarchies, um, but you wouldn't call those capitalist uh, enterprises. Some Trotskyists might say the um, Soviet Union was state capitalism, but it's not capitalism. No. But markets did exist. And so when I say we operate within a market, those markets are going to be run effectively by the workers who produce the goods and give them, provide the services, etc. So you're like a mutualist then, or...? I, I, yeah, I, 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 I class myself as a mutualist, yeah. Mm -hmm. So would, like, speaking of like mutualists, would you say your main anarchist like idol, the guy <clears throat> you look up to as um, Proudhon then? Cause... Um, I, I, I take a lot of inspiration from Proudhon, but uh, not, not yeah. everything, not everything. No. Uh, there, are some, there are some problems I have with um, uh, la labour theory of value that, that came from Proudhon. Um, if you were to say who is the most influential anarchist in my opinion, Mm -hmm. It would actually be Max Stirner, who was uh, the anarcho egoist So, um, and Stirner's idea basically was that um, we only have a duty to, we don't have a duty to uh, serve others. And from that general idea, anarchism naturally follows through. Uh, appeal to mutual self-interest uh, mm -hmm. follows along. And so that's where I kind of see myself fitting in with the mutualist camp. However, I'm not really fixated on achieving mutualism, like I said before. Uh, if societies think it's better for them to avoid markets or not have markets, just um, act communally, act, you know, just, we, we just give you the bread, um, then that's perfectly fine. I think uh, as, uh, scarcity, uh, as scarcity sort of uh, goes away, and not goes away, but is reduced thanks to autom automation, then I think there'll be less of a role or less of a need for markets. So eventually, maybe, these are, again, these are all predictions, maybe uh, we go to a more communal way of living but for now i'm just focused on like if you have a right to what you what so you have a right to own what you use and if you want to sell those things you can if you want to distribute them as part of a great big mutual aid mutual aid group then you can it does seem like there's a kind of historical drift towards anarchism like it, do, it does seem like there's something quite natural about it you know and i think that like would you agree that the capitalists have like seen that that's true like for instance, you know, like there's this trend of me mechanization and and, and like um, where they introduce robots into factories and uh, like 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 you were saying before, like that uh, like reduces scarcity because that it's so effective. But then like they've stopped doing that now a little bit, haven't they? Like where they've moved production into like China and stuff because you think that they perhaps sense that like technology is like that that progress towards like. Um, you know, like in the 50s, we were promised like a grand future of flying cars and free energy. But the capitalists have kind of realized that like if we actually did that, it would like mean anarchism really because they wouldn't be able to maintain coercive control. Yeah, I think, I think, there's, some, uh, I think there's some credit to that uh, or some merit to that. Uh, I'm not too sure about how, um, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't a criticism, I'm just not too sure um, how true that may be. Um, but yeah, I think generally automation <coughs> uh, gets rid of a need for <coughs> sorry, human labour. Um, what we're finding with the most recent advance in technology is that companies like Netflix are able to make more profit whilst employing fewer employees. Uh, this wasn't the case in the first wave of uh, technological advancement because with the invention of cars, okay, maybe you've got rid of the need for um, people leading horse and carriages, but what instead you've done is you've introduced a load of different kinds of jobs. So like, um, uh, what's it called? Like, like um, petrol stations and you've got people working on like the roads, roadside kiosks, road maintenance, um, manufacturing cars, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the more, the digital age the, the, or the information age or however we call it, um, you can make more profit with fewer employees. So, yeah, I, there is going to, and if, if we carry on with capitalism owning all the capital and needing so few em, employees, then we are going to see the working class be squeezed out of, um, you know, squeezed out of, uh, of, of the access to capital, so to speak, or access to resources or income or whatever. I'm curious though, I'm curious about, um, <clears throat> like, because as I said, I'm at a crossroads, um, yeah. purely, um, to argue from a Marxist perspective, wouldn't you need the state to defend yourself against like opposing forces? Like a big reason why anarchist movements may have fallen is because 
they simply weren't strong enough to fight back against like the capitalists around them. So couldn't you argue that you kind of need that state structure, that central planning, that organization to, you know, to actually defend yourself against outside forces? Uh, I would disagree. Uh, one of the reasons I would is because the Black Army in Ukraine were a anarchist army. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason they were an anarchist army is they didn't rely on conscription. Um, they didn't rely on coercive funding. It was like a, it was a literal voluntary army. Mm -hmm. And they were able to outflank the whites, the Russian whites. They were able to outflank the Austro-Hungarian and German invaders from the, from the West. And um, they only really ended up succumbing to uh, the Soviet Union in the end because the, the Soviets outnumbered them you know, thousands to one. Like, um, if, if you reverse the roles, uh, if the Soviet Union were the anarchists and the Ukraine were the, 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 the Marxists with their own state, I think they would have eventually been overrun. I don't think any kind of state would have saved Ukraine from the Soviet invasion. Um, but what you can do is you can still have uh, means of self-defense. You can still own guns. You can still um, get together an organized group of workers and say, right, okay, we need to defend our territory, we need to defend our homes, blah, 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 blah. Um, and you can do that like the Black Army did without conscription. And even that, even in those circumstances, the, um, the command was still democratic. They still had... Um, was it still, though? Yes. Was it though? Yeah. yeah. Um, Matno was quite influential, and so they, they kind of like delegated a lot of um, command to him. But... Mm -hmm. um, the commanders, his sub-commanders were, were democratically elected. Um, mm -hmm. And there were similar vibes in the Catalonian Catalon movement as well. So, um, yeah, you, you, can, you can easily um, do that with our state. Um, my problem with the Marxist state or the dictatorship of the proletariat is um, when you have a, a state that is justifying itself out of a necessity to bring about material conditions or in general, specifically the material conditions needed to uh, enact communism and it's doing something other than preserving rights and democracy then you are um, not opening the door but you're, you're effectively justifying the doing away with the latter so you can get rid of freedom, you can get rid of democracy um, because we are justified in our, our move towards communism and any kind of opposition to us is in opposition to our move towards communism and so therefore we need to deny other parties access to political power. We need to keep the bourgeoisie well out of power. We need to be able to decide, decide who can join the party, who can decide what sort of unions can happen. Lenin would have said, you know, the anarchists are counter-revolutionaries, so we push mm -hmm. their movements. Um, and this is all for the sake of defending, uh, the, this is all for defending the revolution, maintaining the revolution. Um, but we don't really see that as much with a liberal state. I have many criticisms of the liberal state, but we don't see that because they justify themselves through maintaining democracy. They justify themselves through maintaining certain freedoms rather than like a, a, a progression towards another goal. I was about to say that um, don't like um, a lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of Trotsky's conceptions of what you know the Marxist state should be. Don't they have like measures that prevent like um, certain people from rising to power, like giving all state employees like a worker's wage kind of like don't they have like measures against that kind of like place measures that would make the state less coercive if uh, it... yeah but i don't think they work like to maintain their own goals because trotsky was still a marxist he's yeah. still a marxist leninist as well and so we still believe the fate of lenin but trotsky was outed because they recognized that uh, his plans would see the bourgeoisie come back into the come back into the picture um, you know, and there are some contradictions with, own, with Trotsky's own theory, which was like a, this idea of mass democracy uh, alongside international socialism or the permanent revolution. Um, the big thing with Stalin was he was putting the Soviet Union first and he was saying, right, we need to improve the conditions of our own people and, you know, before we focus on rejuvenating the socialist movement in Europe. Um, I'm not too sure how Trotsky would have united um, bringing the working class of the Soviet Union more to the, pip, more to the frame and at the same time uh, sidelining their interests, you know, um, for the permanent revolution sort of thing. So I think there's multiple uh, problems with Trotsky. I don't consider Trotsky to be anywhere near more libertarian than, um, than Stalin, to be honest. 
uh, if you think about what Trotsky did to the uh, Ukrainians, Trotsky resorted, he resorted to terror tactics. He was he was um, purging and massacring villages that were protected by the Black Army. So I don't consider Trotsky to be any any less immoral. Um, if if you if you could show me a video of like um, St uh, Trotsky just sat there doing some work in Mexico, then Stalin himself walks in and plants the ice pick in the back of his head, I wouldn't exactly. <laughs> I'd be sure, even though I know Stalin would have, wouldn't have been any better, but I'd have been like, yeah, you, you can deserve that, you motherfucker. But um, <laughs> sorry, if that's where I, if, I don't know. If don't worry about it. Don't worry okay. about it. Um, Why were the Marxists um, hostile to the anarchists? It does seem strange that, like, you'd think that they would be on the same side. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, left unity, which is sometimes brought about in like uh, leftist discourse groups and things like that. Um, the Marxists do have different goals to the anarchists. They have different methodologies to the anarchists. Um, and like I said before, we have disagreements on what the state is. So what we mean by a state of society is also going to be different. Um, but generally the idea is that from the Marxist point of view, uh, the anarchists are counter-revolutionary. The tactics will, will, will result in um, the, 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 res the resurgence of the bourgeoisie. Um, so they need to be kept away from leftist movements as, as far as possible. The anarchists will say, um, well, you still want this, this state to be over our heads. You still want us to be coerced into supporting specifically your central planning. Um, so we, we are ideologically op opposed, sadly. Um, now, that's not to say uh, we, we hinder um, Marxists wherever we go. There are lots of things that we, we do agree on. So we do we do agree that fascists should be kept out of power. Uh, we should dis we should act against fascist mobilization. So that that's why we come together with um, Antifa, anti-fascist action. Now, if you look at the Antifa badge, um, it's a black flag and a red flag. So that's representing the anarchists and the communists coming together against fascism. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one example. In unions, I don't think again back to like uh, syndicalism. I don't think anarchist unions should be uh, keeping Marxists out. Um, so, because that just weakens their own movement. You're, if you if you exclude workers from your union movement, then you're just you're just uh, limiting the power that you have. So there are there are times where yeah you, you work with them, but when shit hits a fan, you're going to have to think about opposing these people. Um, and that's why I don't go with syndicalism. That's why I don't go with um, other party um, other pa party based routes towards anarchism. Uh, if you want to talk about how I think we can get to on that prison, we can go into that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. How do you think we'll get? Yeah, so, so generally, um, I look at how the, um, the bourgeoisie came to power on their own. So it was done through a process which we normally call gradualism, and gradualism is quite popular amongst mutualists. Um, there are some other anarchists who are like, no, let's have a, let's have a proper big insurrection, let's have another insurrection in the army. Um, I don't think that's going to be possible. One, I think... Um, Why not? Uh, one, one, I think uh, governments could be far more, far more effective at destroying those movements. Um, you know, we've got, we've got air, uh, like the Air Force now and we've got like, intelligence agencies. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be rooted out and destroyed in a second. Um, they'll just, just be crushed. Um, I don't think... Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the insurrection out the window. Uh, another problem I have, I don't know if you're both familiar with Vorsch. Um, yeah, I am, yeah. I, yeah, I haven't watched much of his, so, think, his book. So for the folks who are watching this, Vorsch is an anarchist, he's a market socialist, similar, similar to myself. But mm -hmm. um, when he talks about his roots of socialism, and oh, sorry, the, right, the reason he's relevant is because he's like a growing anarchist YouTuber. Uh, and his idea is basically go... He's American, so he goes, says, we need to go with the Democratic Party. We need to expand a socialist faction within the Democrat Party. Mm -hmm. And once we have a country that is uh, favorable to like progressive uh, policies, um, when shit hits the fan, uh, then we can have a revolution. And then um, it's most likely to be a socialist one. Now, my immediate problem with that is... Uh, if you have people who are favorable to national nationalized services, like put a Medicare rule, you have people who are favorable to uh, the government controlling things, then mm -hmm. why would there be any kind of desire for anarchism if that's the things that you're, if the things that you're favorable to are government-based um, 
what's the word, what's the word? Um, government based policies, yeah, but government based regulations that mm -hmm. solve the problems. Um, so my my suggestion is gradualism or uh, setting up a, like a counter hegemony where um, you have less of a need to rely on either the state or capitalist enterprise. Uh, you go by expanding the cooperative movement, you go for expanding the union movement, you have more um, mutual aid in place. So the groundwork for this anarchist society is sort of already existing and already thriving underneath uh, the capitalist system, underneath uh, the state and everything else. So it's already, it already exists. Now the bourgeoisie did something very similar. Capitalism already existed underneath the monarchy. All they had to do was eventually get rid of the monarchy because the monarchy was you know, doing things for their own interests and not mm -hmm. because whatever, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to have those grounds in place before you can actually uh, say, right, okay, let's do away with the rest of the system. Because right now, whilst we don't have those, um, a, a strong cooperative sector, we don't have a strong mutual aid network, uh, I say, hey, let's get rid of the state. Well, the answer is, well, what do we do about crime? What do we do about uh, the economy? What do we do about healthcare? What do we do about infrastructure? Blah, 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 blah. Because they don't know. They don't see how it could be done because it's not there right in front of them. And I'm talking about moderates now. So if shit did hit the fan, uh, they are going to be more favourable to a status solution than an anarchist one because we don't really have a, uh, a cooperative sector to fall back on. If you know what I mean? We don't have an anarchistic foundations in place to sort of say, well, let's do more of that. So. Like, um, I was about to say about gradualism, couldn't you do this through culture? Like, for example, um, and there are some famous like anarchists, like, for example, um, I don't know if you two have heard of the rapper Lu like Lupe Fiasco or not. Have you guys heard of him? I haven't. No, but um, he's a famous rapper. He was pretty huge in like the 2000s, but he was actually famous as like an anarchist, or at least he was rumored to be an anarchist. Like he promoted like many anarchist ideas in his songs and stuff. Like, do you think that culture, like people like people like Lupe Fiasco, could help with a gradualist approach or not? Yeah, it could certainly help, but then it's not the, it's not necessarily no. the, uh, the only solution. Um, and this is this is one of the problems I have with liberals in terms of their own practice. Mm -hmm. It's a, a lot of it is like posturing. It's just, oh, let's have a demonstration. Okay, um, mm -hmm. we kind of already know these things are bad, but what are you going to do about it? Do we do a general strike? Do we do um, any kind of? We already had the Occupy movement, which wasn't that great and didn't result in much. But um, you know, are, are, are you funding the uh, mutual aid? Are you funding any like uh, unions or are you funding like, any mutual aid groups? Maybe not. Um, Black Lives Matter has been the only movement, well, in the recent times, the only sort of movement which liberals like, which has actually had any kind of effect on you know, the, the, the politics of the day. So um, I think if anarchists are to, are to be successful, then they need to have their own federation or their own political movement, like Black Lives Matter, or multiple of these things, different ones for different areas, that operates in a similar way to Black Lives Matter, um, but focusing on like a general anarchist approach. Um, and this way, and this is different to like cooperatives or unions because cooperatives and unions still have to, they have to, pro they have to focus their, um, their duties uh, to mm -hmm. like promoting the, the, um, the immediate interests of uh, the working class. Whereas an anarchist federation can focus on, long, on the long term. They can exclude, exclude other people and you know, try and bring people who are like, consistent with the beliefs in the movement. Um, so I, I see, so, so the, the, the two um, organizations or types of organizations which I think are actually capable of having a good influence in like the revolutionary movement would be an anarchist federation or a revolutionary party. Guess which one I'm, I'm in favor of, in which case which one I'm, I'm opposed to. But um, yeah, that's kind I of- I think you're in favor of the revolutionary party. Uh, oh yeah, oh, Just kidding. All, yeah. All, all the way, all the way. I know you love him. But um, so I was about to say, don't you need like, would you not need that like, you know, change in cultural whatever to stop an anarchist federation being corrupted? Because like, let's say there is such like a direct democratic like decision making, surely couldn't that make it so that one demagogue like can rise to power? Yeah, we need, yeah. we need to have a general understanding of how of, of, sorry, of what is what, what is anarchism, and I'll give it back mm -hmm. to what I said before, with the, uh, it's the anarchist critique of power um, based on the fact that it doesn't justify itself. 
So I think as soon as a uh, federation that starts um, coercing people to join its movement, saying, you know, mm-hmm. like, like give, give us your support or else, then you're not, you're not, an, you're not an anarchist, mm-hmm. you're not an anarchist movement, you're just calling yourself that. Um, we, should, we should be uh, galvanizing support through persuasion, not in position. Um, uh, so, if, and if you think about, um, if, 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 like, if you do get a demagogue in power, then it's, it's difficult because I, 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 in some ways you can call Matt now a demagogue, as in he was a, a bit of a personality cult at times. Um, so we need to be careful with that. Um, but this, that, that problem applies to literally every organization in existence. Like parties can get, have a demagogue. Um, we have what happened now. Donald Trump was one. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn was dangerously close to being like um, a personality cult. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it's just problems to look out for with that. With, with that. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to have to be up to the people within that federation to sort of self-regulate. You know? I mean, <laughs> an anarchist who doesn't believe in self-regulation, well... Uh, <laughs> I suppose... I'm oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You, ca- you carry on. I was just going to say, like, anarchism seems, it's quite rare, at least in, the, in like, um, like recent historical time, like, it's quite rare an, an occurrence. Now, like, why do you think that is? Like, why do you think people put up with these kind of authoritarian power structures that kind of crush them? You know, like, what, what is it that allows these structures to maintain themselves? Um, I think, like Aaron Marsh said, uh, I think it's a lot to do with the culture of the day. Um, I think... The lack of uh, those kind of mutual aid and cooperative foundations. Um, so, if we if we cast our minds back to the Russian Revolution, I think the reason why the Marxists were popular was because one, I think they had uh, far better ways of getting their message across. But I think it was easier for them to do so because when they say, "Okay, we're going to uh, we're going to organize society using the state, and we're going to do it from like a top down method," that is far more familiar to people living under the Tsarist rule than it was to say, um, hey, we're gonna get we're gonna um, we're gonna get rid of a state and we're gonna do it all voluntarily. I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, that sounds that sounds completely alien to me. So um, however alternatively I think um, anarchists have will have a much better time in liberal democracies saying um, hey what what we want to do, we want to have like a more direct democracy, we want to have a dem- democratic economy. We're going to be focusing on freedom, we're going to be focused on freedom of speech, freedom of expression, blah, blah, blah. And um, we're going to have a much better time convincing liberals than communists are when they sort of say, yeah, we're going to get rid of uh, bourgeois democracy, we're going to have a one-party state, we're going to have central planning every five years. So I think um, if you have a freedom that likes culture, or, or like some kind of, uh, if, sorry, if you have a culture that is um, amicable of freedom, then um, you've got, you're going to have an advantage. But... Um, it's, gen- it's generally just an unawareness of um, the systems that we like to say will will carry out the basic necessary functions of society. Um, but if you're, I mean, about time, is by aliens people, so you get what I mean. So then the internet is a huge advantage then, because it, it, it allows people to be educated about um, like the, the societies that they're, that they're living in. Yeah, it allows people to educate it, but it, it's a bit of a nuance when it comes to the internet because um, before um, like media coverage was done by like quite elitist institutions, as in they, they cared about the people who were able to come in and put a, put a message out. Whereas when you have um, social media, um, any sort can come on and um, and publish reviews. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what it, one of the bad consequences of that is you get a lot of, um, well, bad sources, um, some fake, like, fake news or uh, really crap arguments being uh, reinforced, etc. So it nuance with the, um, the, so this, the um, social media and part of it or the internet. But yeah, uh, generally, there's advantages to be had, but we've got to be wary of you know, the, the, the negatives as well. If it makes our movement easier to spread, it makes mm-hmm. bad movements easier to spread as well. Yeah. So... That's a problem with uh, proportional representation. Like um, a lot of socialists now in the Labour Party are sort of saying, "Hey, we we want to have proportional representation." Well, so are you? So are like, the BNP? So are you know? It's it's not all uh, it's not all well and good. You know, <laughs> even if you do sort of support them. 
I was about to say though, um, <clears throat> about anarchism, like one dilemma I've seen is like, how would it work in, let's say a third world country where they can't even like necessarily self-organize because most of the population isn't even literate. Like how would anarchism work in like such a country that doesn't have the inf- infrastructure, doesn't have like the capabilities to self-organize? Would, would that kind of society need, like, need a state? Uh, well, it's interesting you bring it up because uh, there are many societies in like third world countries or in second world countries where um, some parts of those countries have literally no influence on the state. Uh, mm-hmm. There's areas in Africa where uh, the people just sort of go through the borders, uh, cross borders, but don't even realise it. Um, but you go, you go to them and you ask them, "Oh, um, what do you think of the government?" And they think, "Well, who's in charge? What's going on?" So. Again, it's, I, I'm not really an expert on how um, those kind of demographics maybe um, Aren't they more failed states, way. though? Aren't they more fa- like failed states, like, rather than like anarchist collectives? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I think you can have, not, I, I think you can have a failed, I don't think it necessarily needs to be a failed state to have no influence in the area. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what we did was Uganda, where, uh, oh, I was, I was listening to an, an anarchist from one of these areas, and he was basically saying, um, we just don't, we're just not touched by the government, we're, we're quite remote. Um, uh, failed states are, each, they're, they're slightly different. That's, that's, mm-hmm. like a, you end, that's where you do end up with a power vacuum. You know. Maybe you can get like a bit of an anarchist movement going, but not always. Again, it depends on, as you say, the culture, and as I say, the foundation of that organization. So, mm-hmm. so uh, yeah. Because I was about to say, like, um, the fundamental difference between a failed state and an anarchist collective would be that um, a failed state usually has, like, you know, people trying to get power. There's no, like, collective agreement to not have the state. Like, usually there's, like, two warring, like, forces. So let's say, for example, in Nigeria, it was a failed state, but it was very authoritarian because there were, like, military coups happening, like, every week, wasn't it? Like... At one yeah. point, I think it was like one military coup a week. There was over like three hundred of them. Yeah, um, and a nice way of describing it is like um, if you have a power vacuum, is like when you uh, take a rock out and then you try and fill it in with more rocks. Yeah. Um, the anarchist alternative is to fill it with sand. You know? Yeah. Um, if that makes any sense. Um, but the, again, I, I talk about the anarchists in, in Ukraine. They came out of a failed state. Uh, the reason they mm-hmm. existed was because uh, the new uh, Republic of Ukraine that was set up when they were ceded by the Soviet Union, or not Soviet Union, but the Russian Empire, um, that was a failed state. That was uh, the anarchists were fighting not only um, the whites, the Soviets, and foreign interventionists, but also the Ukrainian nationalists and mm-hmm. Ukrainian Soviets, and et cetera, et cetera. So and it just so happened that the anarchists were successful in doing that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't see, I don't think anyone. Even anarchists see failed states of desire. No, uh, no. You know, it's an opportunity, maybe, but yeah. it's not no doubt, no doubt. No, no. I can also want to say as well. Um, you know, Christiania, like yep, been that coming in, um, that coming in Denmark, like been there. I'll say, um, I mean, I, f- I had heard good things, but on the other hand, like I've actually had like an alternative view of someone I know, I know who's who's like actually been to Christiania. I think they were young when it went because it was like a part of their football team for some reason that to go to Christiania and apparently like it was quite dirty and stuff apparently the conditions weren't the best like surely doesn't a place like Christiania show that anarchism doesn't necessarily work like I'm not saying it does I'm just you know picking your brain a bit yeah, so problems with a thing like Christiania, um, well, that's how it's pronounced. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've been there as well. Um, so when I was there, uh, it was it was yeah. a very scruffy place. Um, okay. But it was it was it was it was working. It, I say working. It was it was no, it wasn't like a dystopia there. No. Um, but I think when you have movements like the Chaz movement, um, and when you have like these miniature anarchist versions, they mm-hmm. attract a lot of people who. Um, they, those places concentrate a lot of people who don't want to be anywhere near the state. Mm-hmm. Now that could, that could be a, a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, that could be drug dealers, drug lords. Uh, mm-hmm. It could be people with sex trafficking, things like that. Um, so I think 
that's a problem with those places being quite unique in terms of their in terms of how they're set up. Um, but if they were uh, employed, employed like across the board, if Denmark was like an anarchist uh, society, then I think um, you're going to have people who take their security very seriously. You're going to have people who take um, the cleanliness of their area very seriously, mm-hmm. um, and so they'll be doing things to to address that. Um, whereas if you have somewhere like Christ- Christania. Not everyone there is going to be. They're there for the hippie movement, like 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 the Chaz were, like Chaz were. Um, I, I, was, I was watching that quite closely, thinking uh, if only we can get like a trend of this, like more Chazes popping up everywhere across America, yeah. then we can get that kind of gradualism that I was talking about. We can point to that society and say that's what we want, but um, we couldn't do that because the people living there were just they were just there for the hippie vibes. They were, they were just yeah. there for the you know for the, for the good times, you know. So um, there was no long-term planning involved there. There was no, um, they were still giving out free pizzas in like the, the second week. Like uh, what, Christ- what Christania did, they started selling street food. Um, they started selling like um, different crafts and stuff. Um, and that helps their little economy going. Um, and then they distribute you know, the, the profits amongst the people living there. So yeah, um, it's not, I'm, we mentioned Utopia um, a second ago. Not a second ago, but you know, um, I don't describe anarchism as utopianistic. It can be, it can be sometimes. Um, I, there are utopian anarchists out there, but I like to class mutualism as like um, another version of scientific socialism running yeah. parallel with Marxism. Um, as in, we take material conditions seriously, we think about how um, these things can be achieved rather than just saying, oh, if only we all got along and we have our little commune. That kind of, that kind of crap. I was going to say, and panicism is also like that. It's like, um, well, some people may want collectivism, some people may want a market, not capitalism, but they may want a market because that's how their society like best runs and stuff. Like, but tell me some more about your experiences in Christiania, like Christiania. Like, I'm really interested. Just tell me some more. Uh, well, I was I was in Copenhagen just on my holiday, just yeah. on a weekend break. Um, and I know I my friend uh, who is also a little bit anarchist, he's like a little really, but mm-hmm. uh, he said, "Oh, there's a place called Christiania, and uh, if you can go there and have a look." I know an anarchist from there, so I thought, "Hey, that's interesting." Uh, I got there, and um, the first thing I did was um, I went into like a little cafeteria, it's like a little place in the was serving like English mm-hmm. breakfast. Okay, and, um, I didn't I didn't really know how how to how to address myself. I didn't know how I didn't know what sort of uh, things that were going on, um, but they were very like um, I, I was saying. Well, should, should I have should I have a black pudding as well? Should I have another egg? Uh, and the guys were like, "No, you got to eat something, man. You got to eat something." Yeah, just, just a, it's just a generally nice vibe. Um, but they do have rules there. There are rules. Yeah. Um, so one of the rules is no hard drugs. Um, really? There's, there's no hard. Yeah, no hard drugs. No hair. No heroin. No nothing oh. like that. Because they realised that. If there was hard drugs, the Copenhagen the Copenhagen government would ban down them. They, yeah. uh, they come in and that'll be the end of the experiment. Um, no guns, uh, no weapons. Um, I'm actually pro gun, but no yeah. weapons. Um, uh, you can't own cars. That's about that. Well, it's starting to become more depressing by the second. Sorry. It's starting to become more depressing by the second. Yeah, yeah. So you know, and um, so cars will be expropriated. We go there. These are things I disagree with, by the way. Yeah, I'm a little bit of an artistic, you know, but um, it's not. Again, it's not. It's not a utopia. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. Um, mm-hmm. I wouldn't go under there personally, but uh, no. I'd rather sort things out over here. Um, and they're also very, very. They don't like you taking pictures. They don't like you taking, especially when other people are there, because uh, they're worried that you might just be um, a plant from the police and taking okay. pictures of them, selling the drugs and all the rest of it. So um, you get told off for taking pictures, but it's just yeah. the only time I'd go back is if I was um, I wouldn't go there to go and live. I'd just go there to like have a look around, enjoy the vibe. But, um, it's, it's not it's not my model, you know. Mm-hmm. But you know, I, I'm not, at the same time, I don't go in there and say, right, okay, our mutualist army is going to go in and crush them because they're all immoral and they're all evil. And it's, it's nothing like that. So in some in some regards, I do sort of respect. Um, 
like that, that pan pan anarchist idea. But um, I think there's I think there's movements which are better than others, or oh, they're they're more effective than others, they're more ethical than others, things like that. Do you so, know the um, oh sorry. No, you, you carry on. Uh, I was just going to say, like, are, are you familiar with the situation in Rojava? Because I used to follow that in Syria, but I haven't been following it for a while. I'm not sure what, what's going on there. But that was uh, kind of anarchist, wasn't it? Yeah, um, I class them as libertarian socialists, as in they do still have a state. Um, and you can probably say that's a, you know, it's probably justified given how, how things are going over there. But it's not really an anarchistic uh, environment. It's, it's still a state with different conscription. I'll condemn the conscription, but you know, they might turn around to me and say, "Well, if we didn't have the conscription, then you know, we'd, we'd just be annihilated." I think. But um, I've actually got a flatmate uh, who's from there, uh, oh, really? so I've been talking to him about that. He's very supportive of the movement. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I, to be honest, I've not done much reading into it myself. Mm. Um, but it's not—it's not an anarchist community. It's got a state. There's conscription going on. And, um, but again, it's better than nothing. Sure. It's, be it's better. It's better than it's better than what would like to replace them. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. ISIS, for example, is better than them. So, um, I was about to say as well, like um, about like all these anarchist communes. Um, you said that markets were something that have been like present throughout history. Like even if capitalism, like, the system of capitalism isn't present, markets still have been like. I mean, that can be said for anarchist communes as well. Like, um, how do you know Epicurus or not? Do you guys know him? Yeah, I'm from the name. Yeah, like, because he started all these Epicurean communes and they actually functioned like anarchist communes or at least were the, you know, like um, inspiration for many of them. And the Epicurean commune, that movement lasted for hundreds of years, didn't it? Until it got crushed by, like, the Roman Empire. Like, doesn't that show that at least... A bit of anarchism can work. At least a semblance of anarchism can work very well. Yeah, I mean, I'm not too familiar with with that con with what happened there, but mm -hmm. um, I probably should do some more reading on that. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, any any example of like a state of society functioning for functioning internally and sadly yeah. maybe being crushed externally because they don't really expand much um, mm, is, is evidence that it can't work. Yeah. Uh, in Germany, back with the uh, Holy Roman Empire times, we had things called free cities. Sometimes the Tell population, me. sometimes the population would just throw out the, the local uh, laws, um, and then they, they exist for like another thirty years. Um, sadly, not doing much historically, but uh, oh. or even recording what what happened. And then the Holy Roman Empire just came and took it back. But because uh, again, a city state against an empire, who's going to win? But um, yeah. Uh, there's various, uh, there's various examples throughout history uh, of you not necessarily needing the state to X, Y, and Z yeah. function in terms of the way. Yeah. I mean, um, I was about to say, like, I have like tons of shit to do, so um, I think we kind of have to wrap it up here. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I guess we've been having you on, you know, like, um, I feel that this will be very helpful in, like, you know, my journey on whether I should be an anarchist or I should be a Marxist. That'll help me in like making my decision. Well, hey, if you've got any questions, and uh, hit me up. But um, yeah. in terms of if you want to be a Mar if you want to be a Marxist, I mean, you can yeah. be an anarchist and a Marxist. Like, um, mm -hmm. what is Marxism is just a critique of capital. Uh, yeah. Marx didn't make that many. He only made some predictions, but he didn't really mm -hmm. describe. He didn't really describe how a socialist society would look. Or what a social society would look like. He just sort of said, "Hey, these are the contradictions of capitalism, and uh, and shit's going to hit the fan at some point." Um, but um, there, there's some other criticisms with Marx. But um, you know, if you want to discuss that in, in personal chat, then oh, too. hit me up, or I'll come on for a second time and give you yeah. my critique of Marxism. I I noticed in the other one you had the uh, Trotskyist on. Yeah, you know, you set up like some kind of dialectic. Um, that that we. Who knows? We oh, could have dialogue. a debate. Yeah, we could have a debate. Yeah, I mean, um, I feel for it. Anarchism versus Marxism. Yeah, or, or anarchism versus um, Marx-Leninism or Trotskyism. Mm -hmm. Because Marxism is a, is a big, you know, there's, there's loads. Low, I mean, anarchists can call themselves Marxism, but, but yeah. you know, 
anarchism, because the main debate is like anarchism versus Marx and Leninism mm-hmm. versus Trotsky. But mm-hmm. that would, I'm, I'll be all up for that. Yeah. That yeah. sounds good. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. Enjoyed it. Right. Yeah.